Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Common Kaisers. I'm your host, Chris Eaton, and joining me, as always, is... Adiani Nohosa. Hey, guys. It's been a minute. It has been a minute. That's uh, um, that's unfortunately on me because um, I got sidetracked in the uh, month of October and November with a oh, yeah. little little trip to Japan. That was oh, kind that of the thing. last minute thing. That little thing. Yes, my first time out there. Um, if you uh, didn't listen to the last episode of the Kaiju Kingdom podcast, just kind of recap that. But uh, if you didn't, like fun times were had by all. We were out there for Godzilla Day and Jessica was covering the Tokyo Inter- International Film Festival, of which I didn't make it in time because as I was landing, she was watching a tiny little independent film called Godzilla minus one. So, <clears throat> but I did get to see a lot of other stuff. I got to see jet Jaguar in person. Are you know how cool? That is that, uh, you, you know, you can meet celebrities, but it's really hard to meet <laughs> a grown kaiju. You know? <laughs> just, just a little story real quick, because we got, we, we got a few things we're talking about in this episode. Um, Arian, so Arian's in San Diego. I'm in Tokyo. And um, so it's like noon time, you know, maybe one o'clock San Diego time. So that would have been like nine, 10 o'clock your time. Yeah. Like when the stream yeah, started, it was pretty yeah. late, right? Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm standing with my friend Kazuki front of the line. In, at the Godzilla festival and my buddy Charles always jokes every picture I have of you at an event you're on your damn phone as if I'm not paying attention I argue there's no credence to it I'm always just you know checking things or I'm posting pictures of where I've ever I'm at and of course Godzilla day I had to be covering everything so every 20 seconds I'm taking a picture and posting it online, which shout out to Arian because he saved our collective asses because I had a phone malfunction as I took off. And uh, fortunately, I got my phone 70% operational for the trip, but I couldn't access the Kaiju Kingdom podcast uh, Instagram until I got home. So Arian graciously took over. And uh, was our liaison uh, posting all the fun stuff that I could not get up on the uh, the Instagram feed. So kudos to RN for coming through in a pinch. All I did was push the buttons. I, you're the one that were that was out there doing 20,000 steps a day and or however many. Oh, more than that. Yeah. Dear God, more than that. Uh, there was one day I, 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 so I was with a buddy out there. Um, from Australia and uh, we we spent so the day after Godzilla day we start hanging out and um, we met in Rapongi where I was staying for the Fist of the North Star art exhibit which by the way the manliest goddamn art exhibit I've ever had the pleasure of stepping into it's just the testosterone that came off that thing like it's in a fine art gallery and it's just the manliest stuff you'll ever see in your life. Oh, I could have spent 10 hours in there, but I digress. Uh, we ate like four times that day, including like a gigantic dinner. And by the time I got back to my room at like midnight, I'm messaging him. I'm like, dude, we, we ate like, a, we ate like a buffet's worth of food. Why am I starving? And he just sends me back an emoji laughing and he sends me, like a screen grab of his Fitbit. And we walked almost like nine, 10 miles that day Ooh. combined. Yeah. Cause that was the day we did like the Nakano Broadway. We did part one of Akihabara. He took me to all, like we were just on and off. Like he's like, I don't even know how much you walked before you, we even met up, but, but yeah, it's, you don't realize how much damn walking you do in Tokyo. And I am not a nimble man. Um, in those first couple of days, I was popping Tylenol like Tic Tacs. <laughs> like I was waking up and my knees were like, please, God, no. I'm like, no, no, no. We we have to sally forth. We only have a 
We have a limited amount of time here, and God only knows when we'll be back. So, but soon. anyway, I, very soon. Yes, that is the goal. That is more the, later. much more. More later. So, um, so anyway, uh, I'm in front of the stage with uh, my buddy Kazuki, and all of a sudden, my messenger pops up, and it's Arian. He's like, uh, are you there? I'm like, yeah, I'm here. And then he sends me a picture from the screen grab from the live feed because I didn't realize I was standing in front of the hard cam because after he sends me this picture, I turn around and I realize, ah, damn it. And the picture he sends is my giant fat head looking down at my damn phone. And I just I kind of I was like, damn it, Charles, like, all right, which then the addendum to that about a half hour later, Jessica shows up. She can't signal me because there's 2000 people in this. This uh, square where they're holding the celebration at. So she sends me a picture because she can see me from the sidelines. And the picture I get my messenger is me looking down at my phone. So. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Car karma, Car like just, you know, when you deny you're doing something and then all anybody sends you is the thing you're denying doing that, that might mean you have a problem. It, it wasn't the, so much the head. I was like, is that Chris? Is that? And then I had to look I had to look closer. I had to like walk up to my TV, how to get <laughs> off my couch. I'm like, yeah, that's the work shirt he wears. Yeah, that's yep. <laughs> that's Chris. <laughs> Yep, it's I. I um, that being said, I, I don't, I, if you haven't met Chris, a he's, a, he's, a, he's a tall yeah, guy. I have a distinguishable so. out. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> if you haven't met Chris, he's a tall guy, so he kind of sticks out, especially in places yeah. like Tokyo. Yeah, there was a moment I was on the subway going to the theme park, to uh, the Seabin theme park, to ride the Godzilla ride, and uh, I left during. Um, the lunch rush hour in Tokyo. And I have never been cr so crammed into a mode of transportation than this in my life. Like I was asses to elbows and I was the tallest guy there by about a foot and a half. And I was nearly trampled to death by a sea of elderly Japanese women. Like <clears throat> I love Japan. They're fantastic people, but the only time like the, the fangs come out is when they are rushing to make their their connecting train, and I nearly got trampled to death by a seal of elderly woman. So, uh, fun times. <clears throat> so that was going on. Um, so I've been trying to catch up on sleep and a bunch of other things have been going on. So, Common Kaiser's kind of got put on the back burner until we could clear our schedule, and so we are here tonight. To talk a few things. So, what do you want to talk about first, Arian? <sighs> Number one, I want to talk about uh, this movie that was um, in my head canon. This is a prequel to Blade Runner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie, I got that feeling too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, a little backstory on this movie. Um, there's there's two titles. Okay, there's there's a the title that most people know uh, of it as Steel Justice, but we're not going to call it Steel Justice. One day out of the blue, Chris sends me this message, and it's just a VHS cover, and all it says is Robosaurus. He tells me, I think this is a fever dream, and I was like, Hold on, stop whatever we have on on deck. This is you're getting benched. Like this is no, this is it. We're doing Robosaurus, just on a on a on a name and and the robot oh god i swear i've seen this thing somewhere. you have it's a real thing it's a thing Robosaurus right? is a real thing that they would bring out to monster truck shows right? so when big yeah when bigfoot and gravedigger were you know hauling ass at the uh at the anaheim stadium in 1991 they would drug out this monstrosity where it would shoot fire into the air like it was at a Kiss concert, and then it would take, you know, a beat up, you know, Nissan, you know, son, you know, it, 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 some sort, and then just chomp it to the uh, 
to the elation of like 10,000 people in that stadium. This is a very real thing. And then someone took a look at it and like, we can make a show out of that. But how do you do that? Well, they tried. They tried. And that's what we're going to talk about. I believe this is our first ever made for TV movie, too, that we are reviewing on this show, which feels apt. Because there is some, Aryan, you know this as well. You can find some trashy treasure in the genre of made for television because that was an arena where it did not matter the thing that you were making as long as it brought in some modest ratings. So there, there's been some wild, wild things out there. Uh, arguably the most famous, I would argue the most famous made for TV movie is a little film called Duel by Steven Spielberg. A lot of people don't remember that was made for television. No. <laughs> yes, it was like an ABC Saturday night movie. And because it's Spielberg, it was so good. It actually got a theatrical release, I think, with a couple of new scenes added in. But yes, Duel was a TV movie. Not to be confused with the TV miniseries that, uh, you know, like the Stephen King movies in the uh, early 90s really popularized. So hold on, hold on. Duel. That's not a rhythm. You said Steven, you didn't say Ridley Scott. That's, no, no that's Steven Spielberg. Duel is a different movie. My bad. Yeah, it was technically Spielberg's first official film. Huh. Like that was his first, that was his considered his first movie. Because at the time he, I think he was directing like Alfred Hitchcock Theater and a couple of other like TV shows. And this is how he got his break. Like John Carpenter famously made a, um, a made for TV movie like early in his career. I want to say it was like post Halloween, but like pre thing. It was an Elvis movie starring um, Kurt, Russell. Kurt Russell. Yeah. It was a made for TV movie. Yeah. So even, you know, Robert Rodriguez made a made for TV movie. Even though it was for Showtime, it was a made for television movie. So what do you make? He made a movie called Road Racers, which is like a I throwback to like the 1950s, like greaser like kind of films. So hmm. I believe David Arquette is in that one. Um yeah, it's uh it's an interesting like it was one of those wrestler? things he just shot. Do what the wrestler David Arquette? Yes, the world yes. champion, former WCW world champion David Arquette. Yes, um, so yeah, so the made for TV genre it holds a lot of a lot of delicious gems. I mean, you can go back to the seventies of stuff like Bad Ronald and Killdozer. You've heard of Killdozer, right? I've heard of I've heard of the Killdozer, the actual, uh, the real. You mean Killdozer. the dude, the, the dude, dude that went nuts. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no. There, there was a movie. I was in, an, again an ABC made for TV movie um, about a bulldozer, like on a Caribbean island, because that's where they had the budget to shoot it. They get struck by lightning, becomes possessed, and starts going on a murder spree. Hell yeah! Hell yeah! yeah. So those are the kinds of gems you would get. And the thing with Steel Justice, aka Robosaurus, whichever one we're going to call Robosaurus. This was a commercial grab at like we have this uh hundred and ninety-five thousand dollar monstrosity that we built that we drag out to these monster truck shows. It's cool looking, kids love the monster trucks, kids love the dinosaurs. Let's try to squeeze as much money out of this out of this thing as we can before we have to decommission it because you know we can't get it to pass smog. Um so they the the owners pitched this thing and it went to pilot. It you know the movie version that we're watching is the full pilot, but it was split up at one point, I think, into like a condensed version that was maybe like an hour long. As because this would have been like an hour long, like you know, sci-fi drama like on the network. So let's be real. I think if this was an hour long, it'd be better. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean again you're you i'm like look that's the beauty of of these films it didn't you know you weren't banging on box office bucks you just cheap fast i'm pretty sure they shot this thing in, in the matter of like eight days and to be fair they they kind of put a little money into this because 
I saw this as a kid. I this, this, I swear to God, this I thought this movie was a fever dream for the longest time until I saw the VHS car. I'm like, this was real. And I do remember being bored as hell as a kid watching it and rewatching it. I understand why I was bored as hell because they are not delivering on what they are promising because it is not so much about Robosaurus the truck, but uh, a, a hard-boiled detective in a near future of like the late 90s, early 2000s, or like the mid 2000s, where somehow everything is futuristic, but also in the past. Kind of like He-Man. Uh, and dealing with the grief of his of his innocent child being murdered by a bunch of thugs. So no, no. Uh, oh my god, hold on. We'll get to we'll get to his <laughs> child's death. Whoa. Yeah, it's 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 glorious. So Oh, you want to start? Oh, you want to? Oh, oh. Do you want to jump into this? Okay. So number one, mm -hmm. movie starts, and, and and parts of this, like you know, I apologize, but I'm watching this movie, and then you know, it, it they put a lot of money at the beginning of the movie, mm -hmm. a lot of good stunt work at the beginning and at the end of the movie, mm -hmm. and then you know, here and there, but the the, the the for a half an hour of that movie, you're just kind of like. Oh, what okay whatever so i'm sorry if it gets a little fuzzy please reel me back in yeah anyway so we start off in the past mm -hmm. we start off it's this it's like a this dream sequence and there's this um uh, i want to call him nostradamus does he does he mm -hmm. have a name uh, uh oh who we would find out is um jeremiah uh jeremiah jonas if there isn't a more <laughs> On the nose kind of name of an old dude who's supposed to be mythical. I, I, I mean, every cliche in the book was brought out for this thing. So this guy has a power to turn wood sculptures into the Trojan horse. He has a power to turn rocks into. Oh no no no! It's not his power. He is simply the shaman there to show those who have the power ah, how to use it. Got it. Yes. Okay. So he's showing uh, these people how to make things, create things, make things bigger, mm -hmm. just, you know, enhance things. Mm -hmm. um, not too far off, say, what Hank Pym does when he makes things bigger. Not, <laughs> yes. You know. Anyway, so now he then he hard cuts to the, to the camera and he looks straight at, straight at him, straight at the camera. And then we see that our main actor, who is uh, the guy from Blade Runner, Deckard, right? That's what we're going to call him. Yeah, his name is Nash. His name is Nash, which, again, the most cliched, hard-boiled name you can come up with. The this... same year that Ernest that Ernest Goes to Jail comes out, and he is also portraying a character named Nash. Same guy? No, yeah. no. Jim Varney would have really elevated this to oh, another oh. level. <laughs> um, this guy, I didn't catch his name. Um, but he's not even listed on the IMDb. I tried looking up his character and I'm like, this guy's not even on there. This guy has like an Australian accent and comes and goes throughout the movie. Yeah. It's, I don't know. He, he's, he's on a stakeout with his partner and they have this conversation. It's like, Hey man, it's, it's, you know, you're going crazy. It's, it's hot. And you've been on the ship. He's having dreams. He's having weird he's having dreams. dreams. Yeah, yeah. Weird dreams. And the first first thing he says, like, yeah, it's a black guy. I'm like, dude. <laughs> like, Because you got to yeah. let him know. I'm dreaming about a black guy. <laughs> All right. Like, that's what we're doing. <laughs> like, <laughs> this black guy, he's like, he's giving, and he looks at me, and he's going to give me powers. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. All right. His partner's like, You got to go home, bro. Like, you got to. <laughs> Who I thought for a second was Carrie Fisher, but it's not. She, this woman reminds me of the poor, the poor man's Nancy Allen. Yeah. 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 She, you know, she's got a, a, a raspy voice. She's, you know, mm -hmm. rough and tough uh, type. And uh, she drinks a lot of beer and whiskey. Yeah. And, uh, and then something happens, right? Where I'm kind mm -hmm. of blanking. And then they go into this chase sequence. They're they on a stakeout. They're, they're, they're staking out this gangster named Arturo. Oh God! Okay, we're gonna get to mm -hmm. Arturo in a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, Arturo has this uh, the the gun from RoboCop, the one that shoots the. <laughs> I like it. 
<laughs> that that gun that can blow yep. up cars. He's yep. shooting it off mm-hmm. in, in the streets of uh, where? I believe it's Los Angeles. It, sure, sure, it's L.A. And they never really kind of tell you where they're at, but it's just, it looks like L.A. Like it definitely again, as you said, Blade Runner. There's definitely a Blade Runner aesthetic to this, but everything is also noirish because they explain like they they're they're like in like 2015, 2020. So- there was like the great, you know, Central Asia War. Something, and, right? Yeah, and like global warming hit it, kicked in, but it's hot, but it's not that hot. It's just warm and you know, things are just uncomfortable and everyone's sweating. To me, it just looks like a regular August in LA. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's nothing. I mean, maybe we are in the future. Well, I mean, technically, they're yeah, hey, not a bad prediction. No. I'll give them that. Okay. So um uh lee no uh shaw no nash goes nash. after him. Nash. yeah he goes after him he's chasing arturo and um he goes on this rooftop and this is where they put money where they made they made sets and the people are doing stunts and it looks mm-hmm. good it looks like like a good rooftop chase scene yeah and uh and on one of these rooftops nash uh is walking by a water water tower or something. There's, yeah, there's like a, an uh, opening, a black alley, mm-hmm. looking like a like an empty space. He looks it, and lo and behold, it is uh, what's his name, Jeremiah? What? Jeremiah Jonas. Jonas, right? Mm. And he kind of he, he looks at her. He looks at our hero, and you know does a shh noise, and then points that way, and he's like, "Are you?" Nash is like, are you kidding? Like, there's no way you're the man of my dreams. Literally. Yeah. Now remind me what happens here. Um, the he ends up doing like this daredevil jump uh because uh they're doing this sting, so they purposely set fire to the guy's front door to drag him out, and then this huge chase ensues where guns are going off. They catch the guy, uh, Nash and his team. And they uh, they arrest him, but uh, Nash keeps seeing this mysterious man like in the crowd and kind of like, hey, we'll talk soon. Um, smash cut to uh, the police station where uh, the one of the team members is kind of making bets. He's like, 20 bucks says this Arturo guy gets off. And the DA comes out berating the team because they didn't go buy the book. Because they play by their own rules. And so Arturo gets off on a technicality. But not before they confiscate the gun he was using. And we're uh, kind of investigating. They're like, huh, this is some this is some heavy piece of machinery for, for you know, like a mid-level, you know, mob guy that Arturo. It's literally the gun from Robocop. Yep. The one that can blow. <laughs> they raided the prop department at MGM and pulled that thing out. So um, which I think MGM co-produces things, so it would make it would make sense. Um so anyway, um so Arturo gets off and we the cops are like, ah, you know what? Screw this, let's go get a beer because you know we have must wallow in our defeat. Oh my uh, god. Hold on. Let's talk. Let's talk about the soundtrack to this. <laughs> oh my god! This soundtrack. Okay. Have you ever gone to a music store and you just hit the buttons on a keyboard? Yep. That's that's what the. <laughs> wah, 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 <coughs> is wah, the wah, cheapest synth the like cheapest... library that they could they could pull. Oh my god! And 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 then the music at this club, it's mm-hmm. just. Uh, <laughs> It, it's a set, it's like essentially like a and then you hear them, you know wow, wow. it's like what is this this is like who who's oh, sorry continue so they're all kind of sitting around there are you know the teammates are worried about Nash because you know they're clearly his mind's in another place and we don't know quite yet why but they you know they they're aware something is going on with him he's He's kind of sidetracked, and he's like, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to go home because I ain't getting good enough sleep. Where we get to see a little bit of this world, that these, this future that these people live in. One thing that that Nash has, which we still don't have today, and I'll give, you know, these movies like Back to the Future and this. Again, no one saw the damn internet coming. 
no one saw the internet coming. Every cyberpunk futuristic stuff that was made before 1994, no one saw the damn internet. Everyone's still talking by phone, by a physical phone, by the way. And um, you, your communications are still by walkie-talkie and all that good stuff. But the thing he does have is a giant screen, like a giant TV yeah. that takes up, it's like nine foot tall, takes up his entire wall, which I got to give credit. I'm like, we we don't have flying cars, but we still don't have the wall TV that these movies promised us. I mean, yes, there's the big TVs, but they're the, you know, the wide and they're kind of ridiculously expensive. Like this guy's, a, you know, middle... And he's probably only bringing in like 40k a year working for the police department. So, but he can afford a big ass TV in his room that plays that all of his memories are played off a laser disc, which oh brought me God, such right? joy to see that. Yes. I'm like, there was there was like that's too big to be seen. I know what that is. It's a laser disc. Oh my god. Uh refreshing. Still night. I mean, this was May 1991. So like yeah, so, like that. Nine, yeah, so yeah, so laser disc was, was still the the relevant the yeah, it was still top of the food chain in you know f- that that high end electronics. Uh, you had to be the rich kid on the block to have the laser disc. So you know, and to be fair, not too far off from that because then we moved everything to DVDs and eventually just flash drives and stuff. But Putting things on disc and rewatching them wasn't, you know, too out of the context of, you know, where we would be in the future. But it was still nice seeing just a big fat laser disc. And then they show him cooking on his futuristic stove. Like he just puts oh, his yeah. plate and it's just these lasers go over and just cook this weird ass janky meal uh, for him. And as he's sitting there watching old videos, it's again the most cliched thing. It's his. It's videos of when he was happy, when his child was alive, and he's building this toy with his kid, and his wife's recording, and you know he's just staring off into the distance because he can't get over the fact that as we find out, his uh, his son was viciously murdered in a drive by in a drive by I'm in a drive by bazooki like a, no, like an RPG was, was launched at this kid. No, that wasn't a drive-by. That was a straight up. They didn't drive. No, that was an execution. That was on purpose. That was <laughs> man. And the best part, the best part of this mm-hmm. is is this, this dope. Okay, this kid. They get a hat that's like two times as big as his head, so he looks mm-hmm. tiny. And he has this like smiley, like dopey blonde face on him. Mm-hmm. In a in a in a in a in a Volkswagen, I think Beetle he's sitting in. He's yes, sitting. they're in the future, but all the cars are old. They all look like they came out of the 1950s. Like <laughs> again, the weird aesthetic that this thing was going for. I'm like, I kind of appreciate that you guys are kind of you're playing with a really stupid concept, and this is nothing but a money grab. But I will give them credit. It's like, how can we make this interesting? Well, it's kind of in the future, but it's not, and things are both old and new at the same time. This Jeep, this Ford Bronco of a packed with dudes and, a, and, a, and an MPG, a, a rocket launcher. Yeah. Uh, are driving down the street, right? And they see the kid in the car, and you they take the last shot that you see of this kid just kind of looking at his dad while mm-hmm. his dad goes and just, like ah. and he does yeah. the no. <laughs> And then it looks like Operation Desert Storm or something. Just humongous explosion. Like there's the Michael Bay tier of explosion for a, for a Volkswagen Beetle. No way. The, the, this is literally the cliche that Simpsons and Futurama make fun of constantly. Like it felt like it was a Simpsons joke. But you got to remember, like the Simpsons were only like two years in. They weren't making those jokes yet. Like. This this is a TV trope of, you know, when you need to make something dramatic, but you don't you lack the finesse and time to really do it. So as he said, yeah, they got this like beaver cleaver looking little kid, the cutest little kid you can find, hat too big, just waving at his dad like, hi, you know who did this best? South Park. South Park did this best when the shop teacher kept having flashbacks 
of his girlfriend drowning in her plane. She drowns in her plane. It's literally this. This is the this is that trope. Because they show it once to let you know, okay, this is what this guy's going through. Oh no, no, no. We are going to stretch this kid getting murdered four more times in the in the course of the hour and 20 minutes this whole thing runs. Man. And each time, each time, it's not short. Like, they keep, like, it gets longer and progressively longer. Like, it is uninten the uh, most unintentionally funny thing in this entire movie. Man, this so this is what this guy is wrestling with. But as he, you know, because these are his dreams. He keeps dreaming and he sees his kid. By the way, vivid as hell, too. But then every time, like, the dream gets a little longer. And the guy that was following him, as he says, I just see this black guy. He just keeps pointing, and the guy keeps waking up. Like Nash keeps waking up, as you know, as 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 the stranger keeps pointing. So, like, you find out that his he and his kid had, you know, they um they spent their you know their last days together building this toy model that clearly. They went off script with because the kid's like, I don't want a robot anymore. I want a robot dinosaur. And the dad's like, okay, well, I guess because we're in the future, we can just build this erector set looking thing however we want. He's like, what do you want to call it? Well, it's be a robot and a dinosaur, a robosaur. No, nah, no, that's not cool enough. It's a robosaurus. Got to add the extra Let's us. Oh, the they did it. Yep. <laughs> It's not a Robosaur. It's a Robosaurus. So this, much like the cliche of like the dad who lost his son keeps the, you know, the pitching glove because that's all yeah. dads do anymore is play catch with their kid. Um, he kept this big ass toy, which, by the way, the model of it is still massive. This thing's like 20 inches long. It's like two and a half, three foot high. Like it's giant. Like yeah, no parent would like. It's bigger than the SS flag. The the GI Joe ship that yeah. all the rich kids had. Like it's gigantic. I'm like, what father is? Like again, middle like mid wage dude, but has the money to build like custom build with his kid, and apparently the skill to custom make a a RC robot dinosaur for his kid. So. But there we are. You, oh, you're man. not to ask questions on this. <sighs> okay. <sighs> okay. Number one, this thing looks awesome. This this model it's, kit it's looks true. awesome. It looks it's so true, cool. You can't deny it. Like you would have this in your house. I, I would. Yes, and I would tell everybody who comes in like, look at my Robosaurus. I built it with yep. my dad. You know, like <laughs> appreciate it. Mm -hmm. At no point. Did, has the thing come alive yet? No, not yet. Okay. So, spoiler alert, it comes alive. Mm -hmm. You're looking at this thing and you're like, what? What? I mean, it clearly was a maquette we're going to see later, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll reserve my thoughts. Where are we in, in, this, in the story? Kid's dead. So, kid's dead. Dad's having, you know, he's having an emotional breakdown because he can't get over his child. Being viciously murdered in front of him. Um, he's been quietly looking for the dudes that have been doing it, but has no leads. We then smash cut to this warehouse that looks like it came out of the Madonna Express Yourself video. Oh my God. Yes. Where Arturo is partying. And no, no, there's, no. there's a bunch of sexually androgynous people playing drums mm. they're using the steel beams of this warehouse that they're in as percussion instruments yes yeah they're just dudes with drumsticks hitting the bars <laughs> in a where in a house a warehouse in a so, warehouse somewhere yeah and then somewhere in la there's an abandoned warehouse where these people are hanging out um i and here's the thing like was there like a Native American theme that they were going with? Because the fashion choices that were made in this scene were 
interesting to say the least. I couldn't quite pinpoint like what are you guys going with other than cocaine and and uh, free will and sex is going on here, but we can't show that because we're on network TV in 1992 and we're still in the Bush era. I, th- I think they went forth uh, racially androgynous to not offend anyone because <laughs> you know, we're in the 90s, so you want to yeah. start getting into that PC. Um, and then um, you hear a, a knock at the door and out and busts in uh, not Michael Bean. <laughs> Again, the poor uh, man's the Michael Bean. Yeah, uh, a, a short Michael Bean look-alike guy. He yeah, goes, hey, Arturo, the colonel wants to see you at eight. Be there, and he walks away. That's it. Like I know, I've seen, I've seen this guy pop up in TV shows. I'm ninety. Yeah, I, I swear to God, he was a bad guy in an episode of the A Team at one point. Something, right? Yeah. Okay, and then it gets quiet for like a second, and then Arturo goes, mm-hmm. "All right, let's keep partying." And then they go mm-hmm. right back to their Ewok celebration of a of a party, whatever the hell is going on here. Like I don't even. <sighs> okay, one more thing I need yep. to point out. Whatever this near future that they live in, why is there so much steam and smoke, and why is everything backlit like it's a John Carpenter movie? Uh, I'm telling you, man, this is the prequel to Blade Runner. <laughs> this is this is Blade Runner universe. Every every time someone comes through a door, there's a haze, and then there's some sort of spotlight right behind them, magically. So this city is both the darkest and most lit, lightly lit metropolis that I've ever seen ever put into film. At least with Blade Runner, everything's neon, and you know it'll bleed in. But no, nah. it's it, again, like I said. Everything looks like it came out of the Madonna Express Yourself video at this point. Even even uh, Nash's apartment, there's like random spotlights, random. Mm-hmm. It's like so who there's like a it's like a searchlight going on in the background. There's like a sign. There's something. not a lot of billboards around either. Like you don't like where who's lighting? Where is all this light coming from? The geography of the town is weird, but yes, it, none of it makes any sense because it's clearly the universal backlot, and then like you know downtown L.A. like off Figaro somewhere where they went had to shoot some like street scenes. So now our our friend Arturo, the same guy who was blowing up shit, you know, getting mm-hmm. chased by, um, goes goes to the colonel's office where the colonel. Who I'm gonna just call Paul Heyman at this point. Oh exactly, yeah, that's what he looks like. He's oh yeah, no, this yeah, this guy's the again, this whole show is riddled with every character actor from the late 80s and early 90s. Like, and to be fair, I love character actors because they don't care, they just come in and their job is just to be an interesting caricature of whatever. And I've uh, most nine times out of ten, I find character actors far more engaging than like your leading man or your leading woman, because they got a little chutzpah to them, and they gotta yep. they gotta act their ass off because they're on set for maybe eight days, and then they got to go to the next gig. So, yeah, this is I. You see these people pop up all over the. This guy has popped up in a ton of movies. I've seen him a bunch of times, but yeah, he looks like Paul Heyman today. Like he's a big fat dude. Carrying a chihuahua in like a little, it almost looks like it was in a bulletproof vest. Like this chihuahua had this gear on it, and he keeps like he's got the one glove on the hand, like any sort yeah. of like drug lord would have. And he's like kissing the chihuahua, and he's talking to the most atypical early nineties black gang leader who is speaking the cleanest street slang you've ever seen a black guy. And he has, because as the fashion of the time, I thought maybe that's better. Okay. And he has, go ahead. So he has a, he has a damn, um, it's a chopstick going through his fro. Like I just, again, the, the aesthetic choices made in this movie Astonish me to no end. But anyway, they're they're trying to broker a deal for weapons. 
and the colonel, you know, he's telling him, oh, I got, I got the good stuff, man. I got the, and, you know, this gangster is like, hey, and his name, by the way, Tyrone, his name's Tyrone. The gangster's name is Tyrone. Of course it is. Um, and Tyrone's like, well, the Diaz brothers, you know, they offer me this, and this is what I want. He's like, no, no, no. Wait a minute, I got something for you. And then Arturo walks in. And apparently Arturo and Tyrone are rival, you know, rival gang leaders. And but they're in the presence of the colonel. So they gotta keep that, they gotta keep business, you know, uh to the side while they conduct this business in front of this very important man. And our and the colonel chastises Arturo for getting caught. And he's like, Well, hey man, I got off. He's like, Yes, but you know, they took your gun and I sold you those guns. He's like, Yeah, I got it back. He's like, but no, 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 that's the thing. You might have gotten it back, but they had it in their hands long enough that they could trace that and they could trace that back to me, and that's bad for business. So he kind of the colonel's like, Look. I will, uh, I'll excuse this indiscretion this one time. Just don't ever let it happen again. And Arturo saunters off. The colonel turns to Tyrone and says, hey, follow me. I want to show you a presentation. They go to the top of the roof of, of his warehouse that they're conducting this business in. By the way, his office is just riddled with like these large gothic church candles that are all like melting everywhere. And that's how this whole thing is lit. If... You could figure out a better way to make a scumbag early 90s villain like this. This would be his perfect lair. Yes. Um, and he has this RPG that he fires into Arturo's car and murders him right there. And then as a, you know, a, a floor model show of what he can provide Tyrone. And Tyrone's like, oh, well, damn. Hey, I guess we can do some business. But he tells me, he said, well, you know what? Before I, but let me sleep on it for a minute because I want to go talk to the Diaz brothers still. And Colonel's like, of course. Well, you know, shop around for a minute. But I guarantee you, I got the best, de- I got the best deals. <clears throat> so now we are introduced to our bad guy. We are introduced to our heroes. And so now the stage is set for the longest middle act i've ever seen in any any damn movie <sighs> i've ever seen because you know they start out a little strong i'll give them credit like things move along but then this thing comes to like a grinding halt as they start trying to set up the lore of what is supposed to be an ongoing tv show but since it never got off the ground, you know, they just they they filled out the rest of that 44 minutes with an additional like 25 minutes of stuff. And my God, does this drag this thing down? So we just follow Nash. Um, we see again, every time he turns around, like he's reminded of his kid, like he's sitting in his car. He's watching um, his kids play with this hose. He's approached by this woman who. Uh, basically like he knows and he's like you know let's uh actually no i'm sorry i'm jumping ahead a little bit he is where where's oh no they're at another there so again i'm all over the place the next day there's a truck driving down the street and tyrone's guys or not tyrone's guys uh the um the guy that shows up at arturo's place the henchman is kind of singing a little jig to himself launches this RPG into this truck in broad daylight in the middle of this LA street and just annihilate. By the way, did you notice it was a model too? Like it was just this beautiful little bit of model work to blow up this toy truck to get the explosion. Like like I'm sitting there. I'm like, it went from like a street shot. Then they did this heart. It's like in the Sentai shows when they defeat the monster of the week. And as the monster's like, ah, and he falls down, then there's that hard cut of the explosion. Yeah. It was that. It was that. Because I'm sitting there, I can see the little toy model trucks that they were using as the thing gets flown around, you know, as the explosion happens. And we cut to Nash and his team investigating this explosion. No one is saying anything. But this is where Nash meets Jeremiah, Jeremiah Jonas for the first time, explaining to him that. I have lived a long time and, you know, I'm here to help you 
fulfill your destiny. And of course, Nash is like, you are talking a bunch of nonsense. And he's like, I've seen you in my dreams. And because he starts dropping some knowledge on Nash that only Nash would know. And he's like, look, uh, I'm taking in. And he, by the way, the smartest thing this guy has asked, uh, what am I being arrested for? And he's like, no, 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 no questions. You're going, we're going downtown, which I believe is pretty much breaking the like most major law of like any law enforcement. You can't just arrest somebody with yeah, a new cause. Habeas corpus something. Yeah. yeah. Habeas corpus. It doesn't even read him as rights either. Just we're going in. And this guy's listing off how old he is and who, like the things that he has seen and what he has done in his, you know, his long life. We get to a holding cell. That's where Jeremiah officially introduces himself to Nash and explains he's been alive for 2,000 years at this point or 2,000, like a little more than 2,000 years. And uh, that he's a quasi immortal and that he is here to help Nash like he has helped others fulfill potential like because Nash has a latent magical ability and that uh, he is... uh, He's going to show him how to use it. And of course, Nash is like, this is this is such a load of garbage. He's like, all right, I'm out of here. You know, you can just sit in here until you want to start telling me the truth. Because Nash is like, okay, who? I don't know who you are. Meanwhile, he's having, you know, forensics run this guy's, um, uh, you know, prints. Not showing up in any database whatsoever. And they go, by the way, I love the fact that the in the future, like LAPD has the ability to not only look through, you know, local, but federal records and Interpol records. Did like, they say that? That's funny. They said inter- on the screen literally says Interpol coming and they show like his, his face, like kind of that thing you do, like you got to show like the processing of the face coming down on the monitor and it just says no match. And they're like, who is That's this guy? Funny. Like, how can he not be on any record whatsoever? So the mystery deepens and we just sit around with Nash for another 20 minutes as he just kind of meanders about his uh, his his buddies are starting to get worried about him. And we're introduced to this very pretty Asian girl named Annie. who oh. Yeah, who uh, shows up at his car pretending like she's a hooker, but she's not really a hooker. And he's like, hey, you want to go to a place where we can, you know, kind of cool down, you know, legitimately like he kind of it's like because apparently like selling like ice is like a big trade now because everything's so hot. So if you go to a place with some air conditioning, that's that's some high that's Taco Bell in like Demolition Man. No, no, these are the places to go. And uh, so Annie, which is played by the great Joan Chen. Joan Chen is in a ton of stuff. She's been in a bunch of Ang Lee movies. She's been in Scorsese movies. And she is here slumming it on a possible TV pilot. So, but to be fair, it's still pretty early in her career. So she would go on to do a lot of other much more legitimate things. But it's always fun when you watch it. Like, this is, yeah, I, I, I've seen you in a lot of things. By the way, the guy who plays Jeremiah was on Hill Street Blues. So that's where, you know, he was also a big, like, TV actor and has been in a ton of stuff, too. Um, so he's explained to her what happened to his kid because apparently he never told her. And she's like, oh, my God. And he's like, yeah, but I keep having this dream with this guy showing up. And I don't know what's going on. Like, things are getting weird. By the way, this guy, Nash, has, like, one mode to him. And that's always like stoic and sullen. Like there's no other like version of this guy. Like he has this never he's never cracking jokes. He always looks like he's either gotten too much sleep or too little sleep. Like he's just in that constant like, eh. like I'm just I'm not awake for this. Like I just feel like garbage. He, like <laughs> to me, he's like he's being Blade Runner. He's being Harrison yep. Ford and Blade Runner. That's he's Decker. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Decker. He even dresses like him. It's funny. He does dress like Decker. Yes, I believe me. 
He looks like if someone was cosplaying um uh, uh um uh, uh Con John Constantine as Decker from uh from Blade Runner. <laughs> like that's that's how I would describe this guy. Yeah. Like he's kind of unshaven, the kind of the quafty hair, the trench coat, like and he does carry a big gun that does not look like a normal revolver either. Like when he pulled that thing out the first time, I'm like, the hell is that? That doesn't look like any standard like revolver I've ever seen in my life. So, I mean, it's clearly like some custom prop gun that, you know, like, hey, we're in the future. You got and you got to be packing some heat. So. So while he's while they're in this ice club. Like, it's something out of Batman. Like, the penguin would run, like, his legitimate arm of his criminal empire. Turns and looks at the stage and who is on stage playing with the jazz band. But Jeremiah. Hell yeah. And he's doing a sax solo to the heavens. And then just walks off stage and starts walking upstairs. And, and Nash is like, sorry, uh, I got I, I to gotta go deal with something. Which I love the fact that Nash in the timeline of this show of this movie left Jeremiah in the cell and it's been no more than like maybe an hour and a half, two hours since he hooked up with Annie, went to this place. And in that time, Jeremiah managed to break out of jail and then make friends with this jazz band in order to get on stage and start playing some, you know, some freestyle and blues up there. So if, I, if, I, if, if this were, if Nash, I'd be like, what the hell is going on? I'd be I'd go see a doctor. I'm seeing this yeah. dude. I arrested this guy. He's had playing jazz. I gotta I gotta take care of some stuff of myself first. He actually does. They do address that. Like he sees like the psychologist at the police department in the next scene. Like he's like, I keep seeing this guy. I don't know if he's real. And I keep having these dreams and the you know. The doctor, you know, the psychologist even tells him, he's like, well, you're probably dealing with, you know, some uh, uh, repressed trauma from watching your child get murdered. So I, maybe you should take some time off. He's like, no, I can't. Too dedicated to the job. But Jeremiah explains to him, he's like, look, I'm old. And, I, you know, you, you don't live as long as I have without learning a few tricks about getting out of prison cells and learning the sacks. So he's like, come on, man, just give me like 10 minutes of your time and uh, I'll get out of your hair. And of course that sounds reasonable to anybody. It's like, look, if this, if I just listen to what this, this loon has to say, maybe he'll leave me alone. But of course Nash, no, 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 I'm not buying into any of this. I, I gotta go. I got work. I gotta go do. Which then we drag out. He again has another, he has another dream of his child being murdered. But this time, this time, Arian, we start finally seeing the thing that we all tuned in for. The dream oh, goes on a little longer, and the and Robosaurus starts making an appearance in the dreams, like giant, like spitting fire out of his nose, and just kind of looking cool because this thing is the most immobile piece of you know machinery that you've ever seen. So there's only so many ways you can shoot it. And while while that's going on, what what's going on in in his house in his apartment? Uh, the the thing the Robosaurus uh, comes alive, right? The model comes alive. Yeah, and, and it starts moving around. It 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 slides to turn up red, and it just kind of goes. It makes some noise, some paranormal activity. Just kind of gets possessed by I don't know what. And, yeah, they uh, don't really explain. Yeah, what happened? Why it starts coming alive? But it has to do with this dude's power somehow. But this thing starts becoming sentient and starts moving around. Like he catches it, like he puts it in a closet and it's back like in his kid's room, like chomping on some car, like toy cars and stuff. And like, he's like, ah, oh, man, uh, like, this is weird. I'm going nuts. So. <laughs> so we cut forward and Nash has one more dream that he is uh that he sees like he finally sees the car that you know blew up his kid and he fall well sees the car go into a truck and the truck's got this like symbol on the side and he's like 
oh, that's a clue. So he goes to his partner who, you know, the gruff, the gruff chick who clearly has the hots for him. And uh, he's like, look, I, I got a lead on on uh, this whole case. Like, can you do a search for the? He drew the symbol like he drew it out like it's a genie, like, you know, like a little circle thing. And uh, his partner's like, what the hell is this? He's like, look, I got a I got a um, he calls a, uh, a blind informant like I can't tell you anything yet, but just just see if you can find this. Like starts listing off dumb names for what it could possibly be to like the name of this company. Aladdin something or oh yeah like just like again the most on the nose like the writer's room did not spend a lot of, this was like well what the hell can we you know what's the other thing I don't know it's a genie so Aladdin or you know Alibaba or some you know whatever you could garner because you don't have the internet in you know 1992 so it's just whatever you can whatever Arabic things you can think of off the top of your head like the writing isn't what I would call the strongest so Nash makes the inqu- inquisition on are there any trucks like around this area at this time? And um, as he's doing that, we cut back to the colonel who is informed that his competition, the Diaz brothers, have been taken out and that uh, Tyrone has no choice but to buy from him. So he's happy as a, as a, you know, a a pig in slot. And, but he gets informed by his snively, you know, first in command that like, you know, the cops are at the scene. They took away a couple, you know, they might've gotten a piece of the uh, artillery that we use that could, uh, you know, trace back to us. And, you know, Colonel's like, ah, who, who was it? And they show him a picture. He said, like, oh, that's, uh, I know who that is. That's the, that's the, that's the cop of the poor child we murdered last year. Hmm. This feels like a loose end. Hey, go take care of him before uh, this comes back to bite us in the ass. So that night, as Nash is waiting for, you know, any information about this truck, this dude breaks into his apartment. By the way, uses like a USB looking device, plugs it in and can, you know, it lock picks easily, which I would question. It's like, that feels like in the future, we, we would have figured out something a little more than this wild electronic lock that anybody can hack, but okay. And of course, the dude does the most cartoonish thing in the world. He plants a brick of C4 in Nash's living room while he's asleep having another dream about Robosaurus. And as that's going on, sets the longest countdown clock I've ever seen on like a bomb. It's like four minutes because I guess he was going to stroll his way out of the building and wanted to make sure that he could take his leisurely time to get away from the blast radius. (laughs) So as Nash is deep in sleep having another vision, Robosaurus, the the model, comes to life again, comes out to the living room, grabs the C4, and as Nash is having an epiphany in his dream, we cut to the outside, and this massive explosion goes off. And Nash wakes up, and he looks out, and he's like, what the hell was that? He just sees this explosion. What he doesn't see is that the Robosaurus toy is gently scooting away. (laughs) Yeah. From the explosion into like, there's like an open manhole somewhere because there's all this steam coming out and disappears into the steam. Does this awesome, this awesome roar? Yeah, does this little roar like a victory of like, I foiled this bad guy's attempt at assassination, which I have questions because Robosaurus is he's he's on two treads and he's got a swivel wheel so he can turn. And Nash is clearly like on the second floor of this apartment. So I need to know how did Robosaurus manage to get down these steps? Because it never showed an elevator of any sort. In about two minutes' time to get outside where no one saw him and plant the C4 in a dumpster somewhere so it would not harm anyone. Like, and like, and look, I'm I'm taking I'm taking a leap of logic in some of these things, but 
you're asking a bit of me at this point. You're telling me that this toy, this magic oh. toy. Okay, so so that's where you draw the line. You draw the line at <laughs> no elevator or no way. No. Okay. I, I I couldn't help but to question some of the logical choices in this. Got it. Okay. Which I'm pretty sure when they saw it on the editing floor, I don't doubt that other people had those questions. They're like, who who cares at this point? Like, do you <laughs> honestly care? Can we just move on? That's what that felt like. Like he just does, he survives the explosion. That's all you need. Got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, so Nat, yeah. So now Nash gets the information. He gets the truck. He gets the truck company, and he finds out that it's tied to the colonel, whose name? Well, I got it right here, because he finds out the colonel's name. And when they first said his name. I had to pause for one second. So his first name is Edward, but his middle name, and he goes, it's that this is how you know you have a bad guy, especially a white bad guy. He's got the three names. He's Edward Roland Duggins. But when they first said it, I didn't they they kind of slurred hmm. the last name. <laughs> I thought they said Roland Daggett. I'm like, you're no, you didn't just rip off a Batman gangster. For this guy. And when they said this, I'm like, it's still too close. Like someone clearly liked Batman when they were naming this character because Roland Duggins is too close to Roland Daggett. So. <laughs> but they you find out that he's a legitimate businessman that runs an ice company. That is his empire. He sells ice and that he's clean like they, there's nothing on the books, nothing suspicious. And Nash is like, no, no, no. This guy is not, he's clearly not clean. Just call it a hunch. And uh, of course, his partners and everything are like, look, if we're gonna if we're gonna go, you know, chase this guy down, we gotta do it by the book. And he's like, okay, do it by the book. And what does he turn around and do? Does it off the book. <sighs> Shows up on his own to to the colonel's HQ, which is riddled with armed guards, which have, should raise a red flag immediately. Like, by the way, this is probably the most logical thing that was said in this entire movie. Like, he's he's walking through, and they take him to like his the thugs take him when he shows up to the warehouse. The thugs take him because he shows him he's like official police business. They're like, all right. He stands there, and he's talking to this dude, and he's like, for a guy that just sells ice, you have a quite a bit of armed henchmen running around here. And a lot of crates that don't look like they carry ice. They carry weapons. And of course, the colonel's like, I don't know what you mean. I run a... A, a model the, citizen. Yes, I'm a model citizen. Wait, again, this is the beauty of character actors. Uh, Ray uh, Brocksmith is the is the as the actor. He is chewing the goddamn scenery in this. Like he is playing the most scumbaggy scumbag, pretending to be nice. Like it, this is class. This is almost like out of a pulp, like you know, um, like a pulp story. It, it's he's. Just being a total dick, and this you can tell it's like, yeah, you know what? I'm getting probably paid like SAG minimum on this, but you know what? I'm gonna have a little fun with it, and kind of just rubbing it in Nash's face. He's like, "Look, man, like I just, I just sell ice, and no, that's not street slang for anything else. Le legitimately, I'm selling ice blocks to the fine people of this city, and." Nash was like, all right, well, where was your, tr can you account for all your trucks on this night? And he's like, well, come on, man. Like, you know, I do keep tight records, but I can't know where every one of my trucks were at all times. So he's like, well, if you can keep tight records, I want to see those records. So they just cut to Nash sitting at this table and this henchman dude comes with Two phone books worth of old dot matrix printouts. Like that, that took me back. Like you can see the reams. Like they're still, Aryan, they were still connected together. Like if, for those of you who are too young to remember what a dot matrix printer was like, it was just fed. It was like belt fed. All of the reams were connected together. 
So each page you had to tear off individually and all the, so for this, and there was the, you had to feed it. They had the, the um, there's holes punched on each end to feed through the printer. And so when they bring them this, it's just this gigantic, these two gigantic stacks. And, you know, the Colonel's like, you know, detective, you're, you're free to look through, but I doubt you're going to find anything. And of course, Nash is like, has to kind of eat crow a little bit. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go look. And I'll be back. You know, I don't trust you. And the Colonel's like, whatever. I, I got things I got to go do. I, you know, I have a, uh, I have a criminal empire to run. And as he's walking out, by the way, Nash is still, I swear to God, he's within earshot. When the Colonel turns to his top henchman and goes, hey, uh, just, just go make sure he's dead by the end of the night. Because the Colonel chastised this guy for failing to kill Nash the first time. Because he thought he chickened out and just dropped the bomb. He's like, no, no, you got to go redeem yourself. Go, go kill this guy. Which brought this us is, to... Uh, this is not Michael Bean, right? This is not Michael Bean. No. I'm trying to find the guy's name. Uh, uh, what is it? Oh. Uh, the, uh, the character actor's name. Oh, wait, is that him? Sorry. I'm pull I got the IMDB up here. I'm making sure. Yes. This is uh, uh, Neil Giantoli. I'm probably mispronouncing that big time but yeah basically another character actor and Nash is at outside of his apartment his partner's there and she's like what's all that he's like uh it's uh well it's a bunch of uh you know uh shipping logs and she's like you went over there didn't you I thought you promised us we were gonna play this by the book he's like ah I can't wait I can't play by the book I'm too close and she's like, well, what, what, like, you got to tell me who's your informant. And he tells him, he's like, it's no one. I've ha been having a dream. And come on, look, I, you know, I gave you some information at work. You got to trust me on this. She's like, you are goddamn nuts. You are absolutely out of it. And as they're having this conversation, zooming around the corner is our henchman, who in the most henchman-esque performance i've ever seen is just screaming die die kill kill as he's putting the the perpetual pedal to the metal and both the the nash and his partner look they're like get out of the way the guy manages the the, tr the car manages to slow down enough where nash can do the barrel roll over the top of the hood and over the windshield and get up and be perfectly fine Opens fire on the car, only hits once, but he knocks out the, the window and turns to his partner. And he's like, man, that was close. Oh, no, but it wasn't. What happened, Arian? What happened? Yeah. What happened to his partner? Oh, she gets uh, she gets wrecked. Yes. <laughs> but you don't even see how. You know, it's just, at, oh, no, right. she got hit by the car, but you never see it. Full disclosure, at this point. I didn't think anything was going to happen, so I got up and made myself a coffee. <laughs> I, I get back. So you missed, you I missed get, get what back. is supposed to be the emotional tugging moment of this oh, movie. Which, no. by the way, we have no. twenty-two uh, minutes left in this thing. No, the most it's coming up. Okay, the most emotional. No, and and then I see, yeah, I come back, and then she's all bloodied. The, the screen's mm. red, and she's all over the, the. Looks like she got ran over, and and. Uh, Nash is talking to her, and that's where we are. Yes, and she dies pretty much in his arms after she's just like, and like her last words are like, "Damn, I wish we could have hooked up." Like literally, those are her words. Like, I, I, I'm sorry, what? Like, not that. Hey, I have feelings for you. Not that I love you. I just wish we could have boned at least one time before I died. Okay. This, this, I'm, I, I'm starting to understand why this thing didn't get picked up for a full series order. <laughs> so Nash has a breakdown. He's back at the station. His uh, commanding officer is like, I need your gun and I need your badge. You're, you're on probation for um, 
you know, men, you know, it's like a mental health probation until you get checked out. Like you need to get your head in order before this. And of course, Nash is like, no, I'm too damn close. And he, of course it's like, you're too close to the, to the case. No, no, you're, you're off of it. And like, again, every single cliche you can think of is thrown. Like the kitchen sink of cliches are thrown into this thing. So Nash goes back to his apartment where uh, Annie shows up and he is sawing off a shotgun right in front of her. And she's asking him like, hey, are you OK? He's like, yeah, I'm fine. And she's looking at him sawing off a shotgun. And she's like, you're hiding something from me, aren't you? Clearly, because I'm sawing off a shotgun. I'm about ready to go on a blood rage vendetta murder spree. And he's like, yeah, maybe things aren't exactly fine. Maybe I'm a little mad. Because now I've lost my job and I lost my kid. I know it's this guy. So <laughs> she tells him just, you know, be safe. Enjoy your vendetta. <laughs> so we cut to the damn warehouse where Tyrone and the Colonel are performing their transaction. The place is crawling with every henchman you can think of. Like, these are dudes who have been background actors in every 80s and 90s action film. Like, I swear I saw guys from Missing in Action, guys from Big Trouble Little China. Like, there's just loads of dudes with a lot of heavy artillery. Pretty and sure that- Pretty sure Al Leong from Big Trouble is in there. He is there. Yes. He is there. That yes. was him. He showed up. And I think by law at that point in time, if you're going to have like sinister looking henchmen, like he had to be cast. Like, I think he has one of those clauses. Like anytime, like, um, um, uh, was, um, the guy that wrote Jackie Brown. Um, oh, not, not Tarantino. The guy that actually wrote the book. Um, oh, I'm blanking on his name, but like, Michael Keaton has a clause that anytime they adapt any of his works, like he has to play this particular character. That's why he shows up in Jackie Brown and in Out of Sight because he's like, no, if you ever make any of these movies, like I have to be cast like that is part of the clause. So I think if you're doing like if you're making like an act, any sort of like henchman role, this man has to be cast. So, but yes, he is there. I, I kind of I. I took a little spit out of my water, too, when I saw him. I'm like, get the hell out of here. Of course you're slumming down here. This was probably this probably paid for a Ford pickup truck for you. So, But good on him. So now shows up with his sawed-off shotgun. And there's about maybe like 100 armed dudes running around. And he's about ready to go in there. Which, by the way, you're going with, a, with one single shotgun that maybe holds four rounds apiece. And, you know if his long coat is lined with shells, like he's going to be dead in the first three minutes. There's no way like this guy's going to, you know, it, it, it's going to be like a, a four-year-old playing, you know, call of duty. Like you're just going to die as you walk out the, out the front door. But of course, who's there to stop him? It's uh, our boy. No, Nostradamus. No, Jeremiah. John, <laughs> Jeremiah. And he kind of, points out he's like um you got one little gun and there's like a million guns in there like literally like they're selling guns and every guy has like three guns on them and you're one dude what do you think you're gonna do and Nash is like I, I don't care I don't care anymore and that's when Jeremiah's like are you uh are you trying to get revenge or are you trying to die which is it and Nash is like I don't you know it does does it even matter anymore and Jeremiah is like look man before you go on your vendetta, look, I've been trying to show you something. Let me show you what to do. Just trust me. Give me five minutes. And Nash is like, all right, whatever. You got five minutes before I go on this murder-suicide spree. So he starts, like, communing with him. And this light, like, kind of hits both of them. And, like, there's wind out of nowhere. And, of course, there's a bunch of dudes running around. Don't notice these two dudes just hanging on the corner 
by a fence and they're kind of hiding behind like a half brick wall, half like fence kind of facade. And they're just sitting standing there having a conversation and they're like doing like some like hokum kind of weird looking thing. And then all of a sudden they both kind of like collapse a little bit. Nash is like, what happened? And Jeremiah's like, nothing. Because I ain't getting through to you. You're blocking me. So I guess I got to do this myself. And points out, he's like, well, remember, man, I, you know, I can live forever, but I ain't immortal. I was like, wait, what the hell is that supposed to mean? He's like, I can't be killed. So I'm just going to go up to these guys. And uh, this part, you know, if you're not going <laughs> to. If you ain't going to tap into the power, I guess I'm going to go die. I've been alive for two, two and a half thousand years. This, maybe, this yeah, guy, maybe today, yeah, maybe it's time. This guy goes up to our, our, our family friends group of henchmen thugs and starts trash talking them. Just like they, they try to let him go. They try to let him go. It's like, hey, man, you know, I just not tonight, buddy. Go the other way. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, I want to go where the guns are. I want to go where everything. It's like, all right, well, get now you gotta die. So, now here comes to the emotional climax of the movie. From what I can call, <clears throat> here we go. So uh, Nash does this thing where I, the best way I can describe it is, you know, you're with you're with a partner, right? And mm-hmm. you know, you're. You're having sex getting with your partner. Down. You're getting, getting down. down. Getting yeah. down. Yeah. And you wanna you wanna make the moment last just a little bit longer. So uh-huh. you hold it in. Yeah. That's exactly what this guy's doing. <laughs> did did you ever watch the show The League? The League? Yeah. Yeah. He was having his vinegar strokes moment. Yeah. Yes. Was, yeah, this this got weirdly sexual for a moment. Like I was sitting there, like, are you uh, really? Because yes, this uh, Nash looks like he's trying to think about baseball as um, he's receiving, yeah, as he's receiving sexual favors from um, a lady of the night. We'll just call clearly, it like that. Clearly, here's the here's the yes. best part. Clearly, he's thinking. The vision is of Jeremiah. <laughs> like, he's thinking, oh, yes, he's thinking about Jeremiah and his dead son, and then all of a sudden, he starts picturing Robosaurus. And at this point, there's this gigantic light on him, like, like he's he, like radiating for some reason, as he's like breathing heavy. And Jeremiah's like, "All right, you're gonna do whatever you're gonna do. You better do it now because, you know, this guy's gonna shoot me in the face." And then what we all tuned in for, Look, what this show was promising us, finally arrives. Arian, I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna let you take this portion. All right. So, so Nash comes. All right. Mm-hmm. He co- he creams his pants, and then you hear a roar in the back, and every, it grabs the thug's attention, and out comes Robosaurus. This thing is like the size of a Gundam. This thing is huge. It starts wrecking shit immediately. And of course, you know, you've seen Daimajin. Everyone yep. has. Yep. Essentially, this is Daimajin for the next 10 minutes. Yep. This, this robot dinosaur, Robosaurus, goes around wrecking shit. You know, everyone's shooting guns at it. And, and it's, you know, grabbing fences, destroying it. It's moving somehow. I, I mean, it's 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 traveling. It's in, in well. Look, I'll say it's causing some property damage, but it's not doing it very well. Mm, awkwardly, yeah, yeah. It, 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 the camera angles are are good, but you know, it's, it's being careful about There's it. There's a lot of shots of it raising its head and shooting flames out of its nose. Well, Close up shots, not yes. full. Yes. <laughs> uh, it picks up. It picks up a, a knot. Uh, anyway, it, it wrecks the fence, you know. Mm-hmm. In in goes in goes Nash, and uh, everybody disperses. Uh, Jeremiah gets uh, gets free, and and it continues walking into the base, talking trash about everybody shooting <laughs> this robot uh, Robosaurus. Mm-hmm. Robosaurus picks up not Michael Bean and holds mm-hmm. him there for a while. 
then you see Jeremiah pop up and says, like, hey, man, you owe me an apology. Otherwise, I'm going to have him drop you. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry. This, this is the, oh, yeah, it's the most groveling the moment I've seen. Oh, my goodness. Um, then Nash, Nash uh, catches up with him, and he goes, like, hey, man, I'm going to come clean. I'm just, I'm just doing this for a job. They went that way. Mm-hmm. I'll go. You know, Al goes. Uh, Dro- uh, Paul, yeah, Paul drops a dime on his boss like that, as he's in the clutches of this giant, uh, this giant monster truck dinosaur robot. So Paul Heyman, or sorry, what's his name? The Colonel. The Colonel. Uh, in a in a station wagon is on mm. the, on the getaway. Yeah, and uh, and Nash, you know, gets close to you know, he he catches up, doesn't quite get him. Uh, uh, Colonel peels out, and is it is he about to shoot him? There's something going on there. He's about to shoot him, and then he he carjacks another car. Got it. Yeah. And then he drives away. Yeah. But not not before he gets caught by Robosaurus. Mm-hmm. Robosaurus grabs him, mm-hmm. brings him up, crushes him, and does he? I think he shoots fire. He shoots yeah. fire into the car. Like it is. It, <laughs> Like this is the mo- yeah like, yes you stand up and you clap like yes this is what this move this is and there's this beautiful like wide shot of the Robo Source with the crush car that's on fire in its hands and when it lets it go it's the most clumsiest drop of anything you've ever seen like I feel like they're like look man this is like the last night of shooting that we have this thing and you know. It probably runs on like 1,800 gallons of diesel. So, you know, the budget only allowed for like one go at it. So uh, if we can't get the shot, like whatever we get is what we get. And the like when whoever's controlling the Robosaurus, like the team, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's the same team that does it at the Monster Truck shows. It just get like the claws just open and it just does like the forklift, like little drop and this haphazard charred remains of doesn't even look like the same car just plop down and then the you know the, it clearly falls like on the on the roof and then explodes of course. just boom of course yeah so nash watches as the guy that murdered his kid is charred to a crisp robosaurus lets out this mighty roar of victory and in the in the best fashion that you know uh, a 1992 made for tv movie could have robosaurus vanishes into the air with one of those wonderful after effects shots of it flashing for like 2 seconds and then it just magically disappears man man yeah that's so this whole movie is building up to this to this robot this robot truck doing its thing and I think it's entire total screen time in this hour and 22 minute movie including the dream sequences not including the little the little RC version just the dream sequence I think we got a total of like four and a half to five minutes of this actual dinosaur robot I like would, in action I'd say three. Yeah. Yeah. It's a three a good three minutes. <laughs> yes, because this thing's so huge and awkward, and it's the most bait like battle bots are far more advanced than this thing is now. Now, you know, when it was built in 1988, and as a little kid, it was always the coolest thing because it's like that's a monster truck dinosaur. That thing is awesome. It's the reason why you would go, but it's clearly an expensive. It was an ex- an expensive hobby of someone that's just like I just want to build like a cool looking robot. Like Simpsons ended up making fun of this thing. It was Truckosaurus. Like you got to remember, this was part of like the weird minor. Like it was a minor celebrity in the late eighties, early nineties, with the likes of like the Noid and the Seven Evans, Seven Eleven, or Seven Up Spot. Like it was one of those things. Like it was like it was like in the in the pantheon of Alf. Like these things aren't real, 
but we've turned them into like celebrities somehow. Like yeah. Spuds McKenzie. Like I I've always dreamed of doing like uh a Kichi Avengers level team up of like all of these weird ancillary characters that were either advertisements or um or uh <laughs> or just like puppets or something like that because there was a lot of this stuff that happened at this point in the in, in that age like you could truly do it like i i could see alf being the the nick fury of that and just oh god you had there's who else was there there's the noid there was the seven oven spot there's spuds mckenzie there's <laughs> robosaurus um oh what else? oh the, like the California raisins, like these are the things that we turn to for our entertainment back then because you did not have the internet. So this is what you had going on. Um, I would love that. I would love to see the California raisins team up with uh, with the Noid. <laughs> that, that would make someone go crazy. Someone the Noid did make someone go crazy. I think yeah. I think I think there was like a lawsuit or something about the Noid, if if I recall correct. Oh man! So, but anyway, but we digress. The next day, Nash is at the crime scene. Uh, his superior is like, "Well, you were right, and when you're right, you're right." So here's your badge. Here's your gun back. Like no, no, no formal investigation. Nothing. Just like yeah. here you go. Get back to the beat. And as Nash is walking off, meets up with Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is like, "Well, my work here is done," and. <laughs> Nash is like, so that uh that Robosaurus truck, is it ever gonna come back? And Jeremiah's like, dude, it's like riding a bike. Once you make it come alive, you can make it come alive whenever you want. Like you want to turn it into a right. party. Oh yeah. Like you want to turn it into a party trick, you can turn it into a party trick right now. And Nash is like, oh cool. So I can summon this thing whenever, which is clearly the the crux of what this show is going to be like. Every episode is going to end with Nash pulling this thing out of his ass when he gets into like a uh, like in a bind to do something awesome. Like this movie, if this show was made in the mid '80s, it would have been an absolute hit because that was the era of like the the Glenn A. Larson stuff, where all his shows were like gimmicked out, uh, like uh, uh, Airwolf. Airwolf. <laughs> yeah. Um, Animal, oh, I'm animal, highwayman, um, auto man, stuff like that. Like, you know, 90% of the episode is some sort of like, you know, villain of the week thing. And then they would do the thing that you're doing. It's the Ultraman model. Ultraman shows up in the last four minutes I, of the episode, fights the monster, and moves on. I would, I would just, I wouldn't even go that far. I would say, like, this is the Knight Rider uh, bit. Uh, oh, God, if only it was. Except Robosaurus wasn't talking back to uh, uh, to Nash like he was to Michael Knight, though. Like, Knight Rider, like, look, I went down a Knight Rider rabbit hole not too long ago. Like, I forgot just how goddamn wacky that show was. Like, just, it was st steeped bigger in sci-fi than I remember it when I watched it as a little kid. And I, there's stuff that I forgot about. Like, I remember Carr, the evil kit. You know, the arch nemesis, a kid that was also voiced by Mr. Feeney from Boy Meets World. But I forgot about um, Michael Knight's twin, evil twin brother with the with, uh, the, with the goatee. Oh. Yeah, with the mustache that drove Goliath, the uh, the super advanced uh, semi truck. Like that was his thing. Like there was a lot of like weird techno, like, you know, babble that was done in that show. And there's like like evil tech every week almost like how i forgot like the million dollar man or the six million dollar man was fighting aliens and stuff like i always thought he was just fighting like dock workers and like you know breaking up like drug smuggling rings and stuff like that like i completely forgot bigfoot was an android like i went back and rewatched that episode and i completely forgot he tears off andre the giant's arm and it's a it's a robot and there's aliens like i ah, figured it out i'm like what the hell is going on in this show like this is what the eight, you know, that's what entertainment was back then. Like you could get away with ridiculous nonsense. Now, if you have a sci-fi show 
it's going to have to be either some existential crisis like Westworld or it's some gritty reboot like Battlestar Galactica or even like the new Star Trek where they brought it into the modern age or you do the dumb you're you're you start with the mystery and the whole show is what is the mystery that lost started which I hate more than anything else there's a part of me that wants this era to go back of like I want my sci-fi show. You can have an overarching story, but give me something like a villain of the week kind of ordeal. And I want to tune in for the thing I'm tuning into. Like, I'm pretty sure if I was a kid and this thing went to, went to series, like it would have been cool. Like, okay, I'm going to watch the show about the robot dinosaur truck, but also a little disappointed that, you know, I have to sit through, you know, 45 minutes to get to the very end of the episode where the robot truck actually does its thing. But that's how budgets work. So Jeremiah decides, I'm going to stick around because there's more things I can teach you. Because clearly they're setting up that there's more to this power. Like, Because if you had the ability to bring inanimate objects to life and make them grow big, like what else were they going to do? Was Nash going to come up against someone else that was like him, that created like a like hit the arch rival to the Robosaurus. Like I got a feeling there was stuff like that plotted out, but alas, it was not meant to be. And, you know, watching this pilot, I understand why, you know, you know, it would have been a monster truck. You mm -hmm. know. Oh yeah. <laughs> it probably would have been grave digger or Bigfoot. Oh, they would have done something like that. I guarantee it. Man. Absolutely Bigfoot. guarantee it. Driven by Bigfoot, man. <laughs> like, so, there's. How, so anyway, go on. How would you, how would you describe this movie? Because I would, I would say, I'd, it's Quantum Leap. Yeah. Meets, Trent meets Blade Runner. Yeah. Meets Transformers. No, I wouldn't say it's it's like Quantum Leap meets Blade Runner. With a dash of um, product placement, because clearly, like Robosaurus was big on the monster truck circuit, this would have brought more people to like you know, um, you know, monster truck night as you know the tour. Yeah. I, I forgot the uh, the tour's name as it would go on. Again, like I know it's still pretty big, <clears throat> like it's still big in some circles, but man, like you remember, like. You're not that much younger than me. Like you, do you remember watching those commercials when those when those shows would show up? Sunday, Sunday, like, like, yeah. yes, this Sunday, like the Hell deep, yeah. like because it would they would come in threes. It, first off, it would be the it would be motocross, like the stars of motocross showing up, and then the week after that, they would leave the arena like filled in with the dirt. So after motocross, it would have been the car version of it, which was, it was like a rally car kind of thing. Same thing, same guy doing the advertisement for all of it. And then they would wrap it up with the monster truck show. So from what I remember back in the day, back in the day, mm -hmm. in the night, it was monster trucks and in between the monster truck set up and take down, there would be a uh, what are they called? Uh, drag rate and drag rest, but it would be like a, a demolition derby. Yes, yes. And that, I always thought the demolition derby was way cooler than the monster trucks, but that's well, just. Me. Well, the monster trucks, when you really go to a monster truck rally, it's just these dudes in these custom lifted trucks with these gigantic wheels going over like dirt ramps. Like it's, it's, it's the motocross setup. Like they just left it yeah. there. And so these trucks would like fall on their sides, but because the wheels were so damn big, they just hit the gas and they'd spin around and then they end up getting back up and, you know, they're doing tricks and stuff. And by the end of the show, they would destroy the, um, they would end up destroying the shell, which was made out of like the cheapest, like, uh, plastic, uh, you know, material because they had to, Custom, they, they had to put the whatever the local promoter was on back of every grave digger and Bigfoot, and there was a couple of other ones. At the, but Boy. Bigfoot, Bigfoot, and grave digger, grave digger were the two big ones, yeah. And then they just do shit like they just go out there and it's like, you you paid $20 for a ticket to go to Angel Stadium 
for four hours to listen to uh like a like a like a um like a like a 10 stroke engine just go off it's loud as hell and it's just dudes who would normally be unemployable but they found a niche and they're out there just driving these massive trucks which had to cost like 20 grand like per show just to maintain because they would destroy these things by the end of the show by doing because the suspension the oh every time the suspension would snap on something and the wheel would fly off like they would just they, they would beat these things into the ground and then the next week when they went to like Tuscaloosa it they right back into it so but you couldn't deny there something like there's something so simple but eloquent about it that it spoke to the to the reptilian part of our brain that you could not help but be enchanted by it it's some it's something so american and so simple very much so very much so like no world, you no can world. call it ugly american but no i call it beautiful american i'm so glad that they're going and i'm i'm kind of happy that that you know it's not as big as it was but i'm still glad like i like when i drive by angel stadium every january the the circuit comes into town and the three the motocross the speedway and then the monster trucks like three weekends in a row and they're all there and all the classics are still there i have a friend that goes every year and she sends me pictures and video of you know grave digger still out there doing his thing so um i do wish that robosaurus was still active i i think they decommissioned that thing like a while back actually i got the information here let me see how long did he last for Robosaurus was okay. So Robosaurus was auctioned off at Scottsdale Barrett Jackson auction on January nineteenth, two thousand eight. The bidding saw the robotic dinosaur sell to gambling industry veteran Brooke Dunn for a total of five hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. So they so his company, Auto Robo LLC, now owns and operates Robosaurus. So I guess he's still oh. out there. Oh. So it, oh, apparently he showed up at Universal Horror Night. No shit. Yeah, so he's out there. He's still out there. We gotta, we gotta take a picture with him. We gotta find it. Yeah. <laughs> so that is Steel Justice, aka Robo Source One. A failed. I, I look. I give them all the credit in the world for taking a ridiculous concept. And at least trying to be somewhat original with it, but it's also um, you had a you had a kernel of idea and you put in a C grade effort on the execution. So I understand why this thing didn't go to series, but I'm kind of glad it exists. Like, again, this is what the world of of made for TV films were giving us back in the day. This is all we had. If you couldn't afford cable, this is what you had to live with. And I wasn't a cable. We never had cable growing up, so. Basic TV was what I lived and died by. Um, and again, like I said, I could have swore I, I dreamt this thing up. And then when I saw that that image of the VHS cover, I'm like, it is real. Like, oh, my God, this thing is is legit. So I'm happy that I re went back and rewatched it because I, I was unlocking memories of when I was seven and watching part of this movie in, like, my parents' room because everyone else was hogging the TV in the house. And I just remember being bored to hell by it because when it's it's Millhouse. When are they get to, when are they going to get to the firework factory? That's what I was yelling about this. I'm like, where the hell is the damn robot dinosaur at? Because that's the only reason I'm tuning into this to this pile of crap. So but it's an enjoyable pile of crap nonetheless. Like you, this, as you said, this would have made a great mystery science theater episode. Yes. An absolute perfect mystery science theater episode. Like this is ripen for a good riffing. Your final thoughts. Um, I think this review has gone longer than the actual movie. <laughs> hey, you got you can't you can't rush greatness. Okay. Look, this this okay. I'm not gonna say that you you should go out and and find a Blu-ray rip or whatever. It's it's a movie called Robosaurus. What, mm. do you, like, what do you expect? Like, yeah. You know exactly what you're getting yourself into. Mm -hmm. Enjoy it. 
you know, put on on a Sunday evening. And look, at least this thing got made. Like you said, this thing exists. There are things that, well, there's people who are like, oh yeah, Star Godzilla. You know, forget Star Godzilla. Forget that. No, Robo <laughs> That's all you need. Star Godzilla doesn't exist. Speaking of which, yes. um, Jessica and I went deep diving last night on the review of Minus One. Now, you know, this show normally we don't go too deep into the kaiju at all, but I did want to get Arian. I wanted Arian to come on last night when we did the show, but he was busy seeing Depeche Mode, which I, I was cannot. in Depeche Mode. Yeah, he's in Depeche Mode. Like, and that's every time I hear Depeche Mode, if it's not Master and Servant going through my head, I hear the Monarch from Venture Brothers going, no, he can't. Like, like, honey, isn't that the guy from Depeche Mode? What? Oh, my God, it is. And he's with a girl. He's like, oh, yeah, he's totally straight. No, he can't be. He's in Depeche Mode. Like, that's what I hear in my head every time. Um, so, yeah, I don't blame Ari. I'm like, I would honestly skip it to watch Depeche Mode, too. So, I love I love me some Depeche Mode. But we were going to do this tonight, so I figured I'd let Arian take the stage for a minute and get your thoughts on Minus One. Okay, what hasn't been said about this movie? Um, this... I think I think everybody here was lucky enough to watch uh, a, an advanced version of this movie, or a, we saw it a little bit earlier than most people. And, I saw uh, it opening night in Japan. Yeah, exactly. We all we all yeah. saw it. Yeah, I went to the premiere and it was great. Um, mm. This this movie, watching it for the first time, I knew it was going to be special. I mm -hmm. knew um, you. So you've seen it subtitled already. Yes, okay. in 4DX. Ho, 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 ho. Okay, so a couple thoughts on 4DX. Uh, mm -hmm. don't, don't Did you see it in 4DX? I saw it in 4DX uh, the second time. <laughs> I, man, that was, I, I needed a seatbelt for that. If you can see yeah. 4DX, go, go watch in 4DX. Oh my God, yeah. Um, I, I'm really, I really want to listen to what you and Jessica had to say about it. Um, there was, there was oh. one thing I, I didn't, because when, when you saw it, you yeah. told, right after I saw it, I was like, what are you talking about? Because we, you said something about G-cells. I want to confirm that there was nothing said, mentioned at all about G-cells. There actually is that little part after Godzilla's attack on Giza, when you see the guys in the, uh, the suits, there was clearly the callback to Dr. Yamane. Um, investigating like when he finds the trilobite. Yeah. So they do mention like there's there's a news broadcast over that, and they okay. mention that chunks of the monster are being found around the city. So Got yes, it. they do. They make a quick brief mention of it. And my friend uh, Kazuki has read the novelization that was released in Japan. Like it was like a like three days after the movie came out. So he's been shooting me like. As, as novelizations tend to do, they tend to add a little more detail into things. And um, they, they touch on that just a little bit more than the movie lets on. And today, and I know where you're going with it, that ending apparently was shot at the last second. Okay. Interesting. So that's, yeah. Apparently that ending wasn't meant wasn't in the original script and it's I, if the way that yamazaki was describing he's like no no i i couldn't end like that like i had to have a little more of a of an upbeat ending but i also wanted to add like okay how the hell am i going to explain this so you had to add a little bit of intrigue to it so yeah yeah that being said the second time watching it you know after the sheet the seat was done shaking and mm -hmm. spitting on me uh immediately looked at the neck immediately i was like i need to see this because the mm -hmm. first time i saw it, i was like i wasn't expecting it and they're yeah. like hey, i thought it was a hair i was like did i see that was that mm -hmm. was that real um but immediately and and i don't have an answer I've, i'm sure yamazaki does um i don't think he does i th i th i mean i think it's implied but it's one of it's like the it's like 
at the end of Inception of like, is he awake? Is he still asleep? Because the top starts to waver a bit. So it kind of leaves, but not enough to like, oh, is he awake? Or is he still dreaming? Like, right. So it just leaves you just a little bit of like questioning of like, what happened here? Because when I initially saw in Japan, like after, you know, because I didn't see it subs, uh, I only got like the the main strides of the movie. Like I walked, I understood what happened in the movie. Like I understand because as I was, you know, as I said in the review, if you want to listen to that, go listen to the latest episode of the Kaiju Kingdom podcast. Jessica and I spent two hours last night breaking down this movie. But um, I'll reiterate here, the, the difference between this and Shin if I had watched Shin in Japan without subs, I would have been l- completely lost. I would have not known what the hell was going on because that is like an Aaron Sorkin show in a Godzilla movie because there's just so much dialogue being thrown at you. This, its simplicity is its strength, but there's also so many nuances that I miss because I don't speak the language. Like I didn't realize that our hero was a failed kamikaze pilot. Like that was lost on me in this movie until both Jessica and my friend Kazuki broke it down. I'm like, he's what? I'm like, yeah, he's a kamikaze pilot that abandons his post. I'm like, oh, that adds a lot to the to the story. Like, I just thought he was a dude that was, you know, dealing with survivor's guilt because a dinosaur that he could have killed murdered his entire platoon. So it's like, oh no, no, no. There's there's a lot more going on there. But anyway. Uh, any other thoughts? Um, I thought it was great. I mm-hmm. uh, I highly recommend the 40x if you can see it more than one time. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. Um, by the time this episode comes out, it should be up to two thousand five hundred theaters. Yeah. Uh, so when you get a chance to go see it and support this movie, this movie is the number one movie in America right now. That's it's crazy. Doing damn, doing damn well for itself. That's crazy. And it's you. I've never, as I opened the show last night, I'm living in an age I, Arian, I never thought I would see where a Japanese Godzilla movie came out. And not only is it being universally praised by people, but people are calling it one of the best movies of the year. And some are calling it one of the best movies they've ever seen. Like, that's that, crazy. I, I, that there's like I, I hate Rotten Tomatoes, but both the critics and the audience score are like in the high 90s. Like, did you ever thought you would see the day a goddamn Godzilla movie would be praised like this? I never thought I'd see the day where a, a Godzilla movie is a finalist for an Oscar. Yes, it's it's up for consideration. Like, I and look, I know that the submissions for best foreign film like the country has to submit the film and then it to be in part to be in consideration like the the academy does not exactly decide like they do when they do the voting process for the films for the year in america the country has to submit it japan would be toho and japan would be stupid not to submit this thing because i would argue it is a it would be a guaranteed lock for best picture. And I'm not being high, you know, there's no hyperbole to that. Like this is a goddamn strong movie. And the fact that yet yeah, there are people who normally would not give two shits about a Godzilla movie are walking out like going, this is, this is one of the best movies I've seen all year. Like this is what movies used to be. Like I have had friends that don't even watch Godzilla movies. They went and saw this and I'm, they're calling me like, Did you watch? I'm like, of course I watched it. They're like, that was great. I'm like, yes, it was. It's uh, it's the argument that the human characters don't matter. Yamazaki turned that around on you. And to be fair, like I argued that this movie isn't so much a Godzilla movie, but it's a character drama that just happens to have Godzilla in it. Yep. That's that's a really good way of looking at it. Yep. That's... um... Yeah, again, anything – I'm sure you guys did a great job. Well, I'll, I'll listen to it uh, as soon as it comes out. But Yeah, I'm, I, I'll am i have it up this weekend. Both these shows will be out like a day, you know, this weekend, probably back-to-back with each other. So 
Um, yeah, well, let's wrap it up because it's getting late and we have yep. gone, god damn, almost two hours now. So, on that note, uh, if you like what you hear, you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash the Kaiju Kingdom podcast, at Instagram, at the Kaiju Kingdom, Twitter as well. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we have gained a considerable amount of followers. So, I want to thank everyone who's been who has joined us. And also, if um, you like this, I finally started updating the YouTube channel. So if you um, all of the back episodes uh, of Common Kaisers and uh, the Kaiju Kingdom podcast are currently being uploaded and most of them don't have um, video, they're audio only. But going forward, we're going to be doing a lot more video. Um, so stay tuned for that. But we have a lot of other stuff coming out um we will be at designer con next week uh so uh if you've never been to that that show arian that show is pretty damn awesome isn't it it's my one of my favorite design uh, one of my favorite cons yes and there is a considerably large um well let's just say monster presence there because a lot of japanese companies actually show up for this show so including the great people at medicom so which i know arian's going to be jumping right into that booth i'll be in uh, one yeah yeah um so yeah so please check us out there subscribe to the youtube channel because that is how you can support us um and yeah so do we have what we're doing next do we agree Did we decide do we are we doing Starship Troopers, Part Three, Marauders? Yeah, I think we're going to yeah. do Marauders next. Yeah, All so right. yeah, we're taking a little break from foreign. We're going to do like we're delving into the world of direct to video for the next couple of episodes. Like we're going to have some fun. And Ari wanted to do Marauders. Like you haven't seen Marauders, have you? I haven't seen Part Two or Three. And you part said two, you part, part Two is a pile of shit, but. Part three is a lot of fun. So we're going to have a damn good time because Star the original Starship Troopers is one of my all-time favorite movies. I love that movie to death, and I have argued it's a, a masterpiece quality. Part three does not touch it, but man, is it a good time. So, yeah, so tune in to our next episode when we review Starship Troopers uh, Marauders, the triumphant return of Casper Van Dien. Yeah. Um so yeah, so that will do it for this edition of Common Kaisers. For myself and Ariani Nahosa. Thanks for listening, guys. And we'll see you next time. Rare, I'm Rogosaurus. Rare.